One of the major reasons that I'm here is that I think that medicine in general is going to make a huge change. A huge change. Okay, medicine as we know it today is going to change because we spoke about it before. When a patient is coming today to the ER with a certain symptoms, I was not trained in medical school to ask anything related to sexual child abuse. And if I'm here, it means there is a huge change. For me, if you would come to me something like five years ago, and you would tell me that I would be dealing from any kind of emotional stress or child abuse or anything like that, I would look at you and say, you are completely nut. Okay? It cannot happen. There was no scenario in the world that I would have stand here and speak with people that are dealing with emotional trauma. So if I'm here, it means there is a huge change, okay? And I will start by, first of all, giving you a general brief on how we look at the brain, which is something that is quite different than the standard that has been learned today in medical school. And then we will move on to fibromyalgia, which is a disease that we can measure because there is a pain in there. Okay, there are symptoms in there. And then we will move to the next step, which is why we are all here, and we will speak about uh, child abuse. Okay? But it's all being connected. It's all the same thing. And when we are speaking, the same thing that is all being connected is the organ that we have over here, which is the brain. Okay? We used to speak about the brain in mythic fashion. We used to speak about the brain speaking about cognitive speaking about personality and other things like that. But the brain is actually a tissue. And we refer to the brain like any other tissue that we have in our body. And if, for example, you would look at this wound over here, you will know that and you will tell me that this is a completely dead tissue. We call it necrotic tissue. And here, in the surrounding, there is a damaged tissue that if we will bring enough oxygen, enough omnipotent stem cells get, that can rejuvenate the tissue, this part will be healed. What is this thing? It's exactly the same thing. It's a tissue. We have ulcer. We have necrotic area. Surrounding the necrotic area, we have a non-healing wound that if we will bring enough oxygen and enough stem cells to this area, it will be healed. At the end of the lecture, we will look at the signature of a child abuse-induced brain wound. Okay? But again, from our reference, it's the same wound. We are dealing with wounds and rejuvenating of damaged wound tissue. Today we can look at the brain and this is why we can make a progress. We can look at the brain and see the wounds in the brain like we are looking at the wounds in the leg. We have different type of brain imaging that we use, which are a combination of metabolic and anatomical imaging of the brain. And by doing that, we can mark the brain, the same thing as the wound in the leg, necrotic tissue, non-healing tissue, and good functioning tissue. And we know that certain wounds can persist for years after the acute insult, and not only the necrotic area of the brain. So what do we need for rejuvenation? Now I'm speaking about wounds in general. After that, we will go to the brain, and after that, we will go to the traumatized wound. For any wounds that we have, what we need in order to rejuvenate the damaged tissue is we need omnipotent stem cells. We need <laughs> supporting environment because if it's not a good environment, nothing can grow in that environment. And of course, we need generation of new blood vessels in order to make a change of the basic of the tissue. That's what we need in general. And we will start with omnipotent stem cells. When God created us, 
he knew that there will be a problem. Okay, he knew that there will be a problem along the way. We are not here for one year or two years. So instead of giving us repairs, he gave us a three-dimensional printer. Okay, and what is this printer? These printers are the stem cells. We all have stem cells in our body, mostly in the bone marrow, but also in other parts of the body. And these stem cells can differentiate into different tissues. The stem cells are being dormant, and once we have an insult, there is a signal that makes them start to proliferate. And I think that I wasted, you never waste, you always learn, okay? But you can say wasted something like five years or seven years of my life playing with the lab with stem cells, meaning taking stem cells out of the bone marrow, replicate them in the lab, and injected them into different tissue. It doesn't work. Not in my hands. I'm honest enough to say it, okay? It doesn't work because if we are taking stem cells out and replicating them in the lab, what we inject afterwards will never be the same stem cells that we took out. This is one reason. The other thing is the environment. So we think, okay, let's make a change. Instead of taking stem cells out, replicate them and injecting them, why not to stimulate our own body to generate stem cells by themselves? Okay? The idea is simple. But how do you do that? The induction for stem cells in our body, the most significant inducer, is a signal that we call hypoxia, or hypoxic induced factor. Once there is damage in our body, then what the body <coughs> sense is sense the lack of oxygen. So generally speaking, we can take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, okay? We will have stem cells. But not so good, yeah? Not so good to do it. We thought, okay, that's not a good idea. What else we can do? And it happens to be that as in our daily life, also in our body, everything is relative. Okay? We don't feel, we don't sense absolute values. For example, you will feel that you are good or bad, rich or poor, not based on the absolute values that you have, but based on what your neighbor has. If you have more than him, you will feel that you are very fortunate. But if you have less, no matter how much you have, you will feel that you will need some more. So we said, okay, let's play with it. We will take the oxygen up to very high level and then take it fast down. What the body will sense is the delta. It's the change. But the change is coming from upstairs, not from downstairs. So by doing a certain protocol that we are taking oxygen up and then take it down in different intervals, what we are doing, we are inducing HIF, hypoxic induced factor, by not doing hypoxia, by doing hyperoxia. And by doing that, we have amazing results that you can see over here, how stem cells are being generated in our body. And here we are measuring the stem cells in the blood, okay? This is before coming to the first session of hyperbaric. Once going out after the first session, this is after 10 sessions, and this is after 20 sessions. So it happens to be that after 20 sessions, we have stem cells that are flying all over the body. It's like going back to the embryonic period, okay? We have stem cells all over, and they are looking for a place where they can settle and replicate. So we have the first thing. But stem cells is not enough. Okay, if you will take the best plant in the world and implant it in the desert, what will happen? Probably nothing. Okay, so we need a supporting environment. Okay, we need to make a change in the specific location when we are injecting, when we are using the stem cells. In the human beings, this area, most damaged area that are not healing, are lack of oxygen because problem due to blood vessel supplies, vasoconstriction, the different biologic aspect that you spoke about it perfectly before, okay? It's a damaged tissue. And when we are taking somebody into hyperbaric oxygenation environment, what we are doing, we are increasing the oxygen 
in the environment to a significant amount. We can play with it as much as we want. For somebody who loves or enjoy physiology like me, this is the best playground in the world. And I'm even getting paid for that, which is amazing. Okay? And what you can see over here is what happens if you are in hyperbaric oxygenation environment. And this is, this is up here, this is the environment that we use. So we are changing the environment. The last thing that we need to do, if we want to make a real change, and we don't want people to live all the time in the hyperbaric chambers, we need to do angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is generation of new blood vessels. Okay? For example, how can you generate new blood vessels? First of all, you need demand. Okay? Second of thing, we need stem cells, and we need the energy needed for the blood's stem cell simulation, okay? And we can get all of that with hyperbaric oxygenation. We can generate the stem cells, we are changing the environment, and by doing a certain protocol up and down, we are stimulating also the need for that. And the most striking thing is that we can do angiogenesis in the brain. This is, first of all, animal study that you can see how stem cells are being generated in the brain. In human beings, we are not taking the brain out, we are doing other measures in order to see it, okay? So we have all of this. And the first study that we did was on post-stroke patient. Why stroke patient? Because in stroke patient, we know that we have wound. It's clear, it's simple. We are, we, when, we are when I'm saying we, I'm saying we physician feel very comfortable in that zone because it's a pure wound. We have a cause for the wound. And in this study, we proved that we can make a change. But the important thing is not the statistic. The important thing is to understand what you are doing. I always tell the people that are working with me, we are working on sample size equal one. Okay, if we can get to a level that we are doing sample size equal one, and we can predict what happened to this specific individual, then we are in a good position. If we need 100 or 1,000 cases in order to prove our statistics, it's bullshit, okay? Or it's not strong enough. For example, when Newton was sitting under the, the tree, it was a single apple that fell on his head. But is, uh, this apple fell all the time, in the same way. So if it's something real, if it's something that can make a real change, then sample size equals one. And that's the level we need to approach. And what we see over here, it's an example of what we are doing. This is a different view of the brain. It's not the standard imaging that's being used today. It's a quite a significant group that we are working together. People that come in from physics, from bioimaging, uh, from neurology, it's a whole group. And what we are doing in these images is that we are making it easiest for us to look at the brain tissue, okay? It's a combination of anatomical and metabolical imaging. So what we see over here, this is the brain, and here, this is a scale of brain activity. Everything that is blue, it's a necrotic area, lost tissue. The green is malfunctioning tissue, and the yellow and the red are good functioning tissue. And here, for example, you can see a post-stroke patient. He cannot move the hand and the leg, but it's a blue area, meaning it's not completely dead. This is the area responsible for the hand and the leg movement. This is before treatment and after treatment. Cannot speak, broker area, after treatment, he can speak again, okay? Another example. This is a necrotic area. The necrotic area doesn't change. It stays the same. But surrounding the necrotic area, there is a damage area that can be cured. So by that, we can set the expectation with the patient. We can sit with the patient and tell him, I don't think that I will be able to help you with the hand. But if you want, maybe I can improve your memory. Do you want the treatment? Yes or not? And he can say whatever he wants. I'm not judging anyone, okay? 
because there is a huge variety between different persons. For example, one of the big rabbis in Israel had a stroke. One of the big, big, okay, with a huge community. And then he's Hasidim, I don't know how you say it. Then his followers came to me and told me, Shai, you need to come to see somebody. I said, why, why should I come? He can come over here, I will see him. And then we will see him. No, you don't understand, etc., etc. To make a long story short, he had a stroke. He cannot read, cannot write, cannot learn anymore in Tzavta, in Hevruta, whatever the name is, because you have to learn with somebody, some of your colleagues. He got the treatment, he was improved, he can speak again, he can write, he wrote a book, amazing book. And from time to time I'm enjoying to sit with him and discuss philosophy with him, because he is amazing. And after the treatment we were sitting together, he gave, gave me his book that he wrote, and he told me how he can learn again, why this experience was so important to him, why he learned from that experience, and I told him, but look, you can walk again. And he did with his hand like this, yeah, this is not important. <laughs> and there are other people that when they are coming to you and saying, if my hand will not move, then I don't want the treatment, even though he cannot read or write. So we are not judging, but we need to set the expectation because we are dealing with sample size equal ones. By only saying that, this is a huge change from what happened today in the medicine world. Okay? We are speaking about general statistics treating protocol, but we are not focusing on the specific physiology of the patient. So that was the first study. Okay? Of course, that the same implies also for cognitive. In the first study, we were focusing only on motor. Okay? But what we are treating is not speaking capabilities. It's not that we are speaking motor function. We are not dealing with motor function or memory. We are dealing with an injured tissue. Okay, keep that in mind. We are dealing with a wound, with the chronic non-healing wounds. And whatever this wound is responsible for, on the specific area of the brain, that will be the symptoms. But for me, it doesn't matter what the symptoms are. I'm looking at the tissue. We are looking at the tissue. Okay? So this is memory and this is Depression, same thing. You can see that depression is improving, but it's the same thing. It's tissue, it's wounds. Another study that we have done, which we are starting to get close to our issue, is concussion, mild TBI, mild traumatic brain injury. Why we are getting closer to what we are dealing with? Because here it's unvisualized wounds. What happened over here? It's Let's say somebody is sitting in a car, and then you have a car accident, and you have whiplash. The brain is moving like this, okay? It can be also a blast injury, okay, where you are throwing up above. What we have in the brain is two types of tissues. We have the cortex that covers the brain, and we have the medulla below it. The density of these two layers is different. And because the de density is different, the mass is different. So if you have force on different mass, then the velocity, okay, the acceleration will be different. And the velocity, velocity will be different. And then the, when the brain is moving like this, the cortex might move in a different velocity than the medulla. Okay? If it happens, what we have in between is small blood vessels. And these small blood vessels can tear down. And once we have this, we have a wound with a rate limiting factor of its recovery, which is the oxygen supply. And this wound will not heal. If you want to compare it, you can put something that holds your blood flow to the hand and see what happens to the hand. Why I'm saying that we are getting close to our topic? Because the standard MRI that is being done to this patient will be categorized as normal MRI. Okay? Why normal MRI? Because in standard MRI you cannot see the metabolic changes. 
So for example, if a patient like this, after a car accident, will come to the physician and will tell him, my dear doctor, since the accident, I cannot read, I cannot write, my concentration is not so good, okay? And I may have depression because of that or irrespectively for that. What the physician, I can speak freely about physician, I'm part of this group, okay? What the physician will ask him is to do an MRI. He will do the MRI. The results of the MRI will be normal MRI. He will come to the physician and what the physician will tell him? You don't have nothing. It's all psychology. Instead of saying, I'm stupid. I don't know what you have. We are arrogant enough to say you don't have nothing. It's emotional stress. Okay? This is arrogant. This is the biggest sin ever, being an arrogant. And what we have demonstrated in this study is that we can visualize this injury, but we need to use different type of measurements. We need to look at the basic metabolism of the brain. And over here, for example, you can see somebody who is 51 year old that, had, that just fell from a bus. That's it. Not fell from a bus, throwing out of the bus, okay? She went down the stairs, got injured in the brain, stood up, walked again, okay? Standard thing. Okay? But since this event, she become, she, she couldn't read, she couldn't write appropriately, okay? And got divorced, etc., etc. On the casket that you know that is happening to this type of issue, and everybody tells her that she is okay, Okay, which is not. She has psychotherapies uh, all over. And once we are doing the combination of the SPECT with the MRI, we can see over here the orbit of frontal and the temporal lobes that have wounds. Okay? It's a wound. It's not necrotic. And if it's a wound from this type, we can heal the wound. We know how to do it. Oh, so you can see here before treatment after treatment. And of course, all cognitive aspect will follow it. But we are not treating cognitive function. We are dealing with an injured tissue. That's the main thing, okay? It doesn't matter to me if the memory is destroyed, if the hand is not moving. I'm only dealing with wounds. That's my job, okay? Biological wounds, that's it. Today we have even better type of imaging. We can do perfusion MRI of the brain. In this study, for example, we took patient 10 years after the car accident, after the traumatic mechanical trauma. It's not only car accident, mechanical trauma to the brain. And you can see the perfusion, cerebral blood flow here, before, and perfusion is blood flow. It's blood flow. This is cerebral blood flow to the brain. The blood flow correlates with the brain activity, okay? So what we see over here, this is before treatment, and this is after treatment, this is a scale of the perfusion. Here, it's the difference between the post to the pre. Everything that is read is more than 50, five zero percent improvement, okay? Here is the cerebral blood volume. It means that what we are looking at here is angiogenesis in the brain. The same that we see in animal study, we can see that we can induce angiogenesis in the brain. That's a huge thing. That's a huge thing, but this part is even huger. Here we are looking about MRI DTI, diffuse tomography imaging. What are we looking at is actually the nerve fibers themselves. It's like doing pathology to the brain, looking at the histology, okay? This is before treatment, and this is after treatment. Now, for somebody like me, this is science fiction, because I was taught in medical school that this neurogenesis cannot happen. But it happens to be that it can, okay? The first study that we have done, for example, at uh, the stroke study, I had sent it, to, I sent it to the Lancet. Okay, why the Lancet? Because they love Israel. Okay. 
I said, okay, let's see what he had to do. And I got a reply from the editor, and the reply from the editor was that I don't understand how it works. I don't think it works. It doesn't work. <laughs> That's a scientific reply. Ah, huh? per excellence. <laughs> I wrote to him back. The data of the patient is here. The imaging were not painted by hand. The most important thing, the patient are here. You are more than welcome to come and see it. Thank you very much. I will send it to another journal. And every time we are publishing something new, like the first in the stroke, the first in TBI, and in a minute we'll get to fibromyalgia, we are sending it to a journal that allow us to upload all the data. Why is that? In other words, what this editor told me, he told me you are a liar. Now, if somebody tells me that I'm a liar, then that's okay. I'm not a liar. I want to everybody to see that I'm not a liar. So every time we are starting with something new, we are uploading everything. Everything. Everybody can take the data and do the statistic by his own. Even the protocol, even the informed consent is all online. Okay? Because somebody calls me a liar. This is something that I don't like. Okay? <laughs> And this also here, you can see neurogenesis. Now we are getting even closer. Fibromyalgia. I think that the people who knows me in that room doesn't know why I did the first study on fibromyalgia. And the first study on fibromyalgia, two of the people here knows, was because my mother suffered from fibromyalgia. Suffered. She's completely healed. She had fibromyalgia in such a severity that she could not touch my kids, okay? In such a severe pain. I said, oh, shit. Now we need to deal with that because she went to all the best physicians, not only in Israel, wherever they are, and nothing helped, okay? So we did this fibromyalgia. First of all, I treated her, and after she was cured, she told me, now, my dear, my dear child, now you need to do it for all, okay? And this was the fibromyalgia study. Now we all know that fibromyalgia is a bench of symptoms, okay? That once you have certain level of symptoms, somebody can call it fibromyalgia, okay? But we know today that the cause for fibromyalgia is in the brain. We call it now central sensitization syndrome. What I'm telling you now, this is the front line, this is the frontiers of the front line with respect to fibromyalgia because there are still physicians that when a patient is coming to them, describe the pain and they do the blood work and they do uh, the measurements, taking pictures of the location where the pain is and they don't see anything, they come into the patient and tell him you don't have nothing. Okay, you have nothing, you are healthy, okay, which is, again, quite stupid, okay? But today we know that the, lo the brain is the main problem that causes fibromyalgia. And in the study that we have done, again, it's in plus because here we're uploading all the data online, okay? We were able to demonstrate, in addition to the fact that we have, for the first time, 70% of the patients that are cured of fibromyalgia. We were able to demonstrate the specific location in the brain that are responsible for this syndrome. Some of the areas are overactivated and some are low activated. I will not give you a lesson now of which area, what does it respond to, but we can today diagnose fibromyalgia by doing brain imaging, okay? You can look at the brain and you can say you have fibromyalgia. And if you don't have it, then it's probably something else, okay? This is the level that where we are going to. Remember, sample size equals one. If we cannot do that, we are not good enough. We need to get better, okay? Now, it happens to be in this study, which was unpredictable phenomenon that many of the patients have increase or worsening of the fibromyalgia symptoms during the first 20, 
plus minus, no matter how what, a session of the treatment, which was something that we could not predict. Okay? 20 sessions. 20 sessions, okay, which is something like a month because it's a daily session. Worsening in the symptoms at the beginning. What it means, it means that first of all, that hyperbaric oxygen, it's not a treatment for pain relief. It's a treatment that's changed the metabolism of the brain. But it happens to be that some of the patients that were treated in that study had recovery of repressed memory. Now, speaking about me, something like two years ago, I would never sit in front of the patient and ask him whether he had or did not had any child abuse in the past. It's not on my list by any means. Okay? Today, it's an integral part of any discussion that I have. And what happened is that we have several cases of patients that went into the chambers and had recovery of years of repressed memory during the treatment. Which was, and that was terrifying for me. If I didn't have these two beside me, I would have stopped it, <laughs> okay? Because it's something that I don't know how to handle it. And when I'm saying repressed memory is, for example, five years that are completely lost, and then they are coming back. How the rape was done, by who, times, faces, and then afterwards even facing, okay? And contradicting the people who have done it, okay? And then we started to think, What's going on? What's going on in here? What's happening over here? And our perspective is, the way I see it now, this is, this is theory. The repressed memory recovery, it's a fact. And the theory, that's how I see it, is that when a child, like you well spoken before, it's not a single event in most of the cases. It's a repeated event. And when you are all here in this room speaking about dissociation, what dissociation means from the physiological perspective? Shut it down specific areas in the brain. Okay? What does it mean shutting down specific areas of the brain? It's meaning taking the blood flow out of this area. Okay? Taking the blood flow to other location in the brain. Because that's how we can control the activity, okay? We see it beautiful in functional MRI. So if it's a repeated event, and if it is, is somebody that is close to the victim, he need to do the dissociation for a prolonged period of time. It means that now we have certain areas of the brain that do not get enough oxygen, enough blood supply for a prolonged period of time. So now it's become a wound, ischemic wound. And now we have a biological barrier that come before anything else. And you can simulate that to somebody, let's say that somebody has broken his leg and he's a football player, okay? And he's coming to you, now his leg is broken, and he asks you, I want to walk again. Okay, that's what people are coming to you and ask you. They ask you, I want to get to my normal life again. Okay, what you will teach him, you will teach him to jump on one leg. You will teach him to help others how to do it. By why not healing the broken bone? So the broken bone is now a biological limiting to you. A biological limiting should be treated by biological intervention. This wound needs to be healed. And what we think happened to this patient is that when they are in the chamber, we are, again, activating this wound, healing this damaged area. And no matter what the patient wants, everything is coming up again. You want it, yes or not. It's being activated. The dorman area are being activated. The wound has been changed. 
It's all floating. And the main issue now is now that the person is in a protected environment, now you can deal with this. Now the broken bone was healed. Now you can coach him again to play football and be the best player in the field again. And this is the issue. And we can demonstrate it by the brain imaging that we are doing. Okay? Because of this, we went into another study that Yair will present to you, I think, on Tuesday, okay? Which is the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for patients who have fibromyalgia that is due, and the trigger for their fibromyalgia is child abuse. Sexual child abuse, not just child abuse. With penetration. With penetration. Okay? Because we want a clear cut of a trigger that it's clear to everybody. And in this study, we have a, sig a different signature of the brain. This is, for example, fibromyalgia patients that are not due to child abuse. These are the brain areas that are malfunctioning. And these are the areas that are being damaged when there is child abuse. It happens to be that there are many of the areas, the same area that you spoke about, which is the frontal lobe, orbital frontal lobe, etc., etc. Okay? So what we are saying now is that if we are looking about fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia is symptoms. It's a bench of symptoms. But there are different diseases that can result in these symptoms. It might be possible that it's hard for you to walk, but you are not saying your diagnosis is that you are not walking right. You need to get to the bottom of it. So we can say that fibromyalgia, we have traumatic brain injury, okay, traumatic mechanical injury to the brain. It can be some viral infection that involving in the central nervous system that are affecting specific area of the brain. There can be general anesthesia, but there can be also a severe emotional stress. And child abuse can fall into that category. And for different subgroup, the different should be, the treatment should be different. In any case, we need a biological intervention. But for those with TBI, traumatic brain injury, mechanical injury, the biological intervention is enough. For those who have emotional stress or child abuse as a trigger, the biological intervention is not enough. And it's more than that. It can be even dangerous to use only biological intervention without treating everything that is coming up. So we need to make a change. We need to look at the brain in a different way. We need to look at the brain as a tissue. And this tissue can be injured due to mechanical injury, but the same kind of wound, biological wound, can result also from significant severe emotional stress. And whilst we have a new prisma of how to look at the brain and to demonstrate the wounds, like we are demonstrating wounds in the leg, that's the first thing that we need for a change. And we have it now. It might take some time, but the change is here. The change is here because I'm sitting here, I'm standing here, and I'm speaking about child abuse. So the change is already ongoing. Okay? So thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>